All right. Well, let's get into it. I'm so happy to have you here. I feel like you are so singular in the sense, and this is so much a part of the new book. You've always been to me, royal badass, like queen, and also the most approachable down to earth human anyone's ever met. You're like, no, no, don't misread this. This is all shiny and cool, but let me bring it down to the level. Like, and I think that that is so unique about you and fucking awesome because all we all do all day long is compare ourselves to people. And then when we can see someone who's really got certain things about their well being and their life dialed in, and also has the capacity to show what's going on that's not always rosy, it makes us all feel that much more encouraged, right? That we too can like get a little bit more out of life than we did yesterday. So thank you. Yeah, that's really kind. I'd like to start all my days with you telling me all of that. <laughs> Done. Let's it's just, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be your wake up ringtone. Yeah, hey, right, Ali, it's yeah. Kathy. Just yeah. remember to remember what a badass you are. Yeah. All right. So this book, I feel like took tremendous courage. Like even with the fact that I just said, you're always very consistently real. It's a whole other thing to be like, I'm putting it in a book <laughs> so that everybody is well aware of all sides of what this really looks like. And, and, and appropriately, the book is called the messy truth, how I sold my business for millions, but also lost myself. And lost myself. let's talk about it. Like that title already says 17 things. I know. <laughs> what was the impetus? First of all, what was the download of like, I'm telling this version of the story? Well, you know, I had been like noodling on it for years. Um, it's funny. My brother and I used to say things like, Can I, I have not said this and I haven't even thought about this. It's so weird when your things come back that you haven't thought about in so long. My brother was like, we're going to put that in the book throughout the whole drive our journey, because there was just so many crazy things that happened along the way, you know, but the book is largely like the, the journey, the evolution of, of my life and my story of like how I, you know, became or came to start this business and, and how I, you know, I always have thought that everything I did in my life from like the time I was a kid, like growing up in South Florida and, um, you know, doing the, having like the curly hair and, you know, just, you know, the frizzy hair and always being kind of obsessed with hair and then finally going to beauty school and on, and then having other jobs and all the things. And it's all in the book, but I feel like it all like really prepared me to start this blow dry empire, which was not a dream. Like it was not a thing that I thought about doing. It just all the things in my life, you know, looking back were steps to what would eventually become dry bar. And I think that I, I, you know, I don't know where this comes from, but this like, you know, maybe it comes from like wanting to help and impart what I've learned on to other entrepreneurs and, and this like kind of calling or longing to tell, you know, the, the truth of it. And maybe it's like, you know, the, the Instagram era that we live in where, you know, we we show our best side and I, and I do it too, um, where, you know, we want to show people our best side and we want that, we want to look like we have our shit together when on when, you know, on the inside, like none of us do. I mean, none of us do. And we have good days and we have bad days. And I think that I wanted to show in the book, my, you know, the things that I was good at and the things that I wasn't and the things that I learned and like the vulnerability and the like, uh, of of being a, a founder and just being a fucking human like it is hard you know it's like and you know i'm in a, i'm in an interesting phase of my life right now where i'm you know reading a lot of books about you know like whoever said life is supposed to be easy and great all the time you know and i think that if you can have that acceptance that it you know there's good days there's bad days there's like days where like it's all working and you feel really great and then there's days that it's not you know and learning to accept that and live with that and it's it's very true of business you know it's like I always compare the dry bar journey and again, life to like, a, like whack-a-mole, you know, that game. It's like, it is like, it is always, there's always something, there's always some fire somewhere and whether it's your personal life or your business. And so I just, you know, I just 
feel really compelled to share all of that to to maybe demystify a little bit yeah. of like this, you know, this glamorized because I think in the last 10 years, which I, you know, I'm very feel very humble to be at the forefront of like entrepreneurs became this thing and like really celebrated and which is fucking awesome, especially women, you know, that are really being celebrated for starting businesses. Like there's, you know, we have our own like category now, you know, and I'm just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not all, it's not all roses and sunshine. There's, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors there and, and not a, a lot of people are talking about it. And so the book, sorry, this is the longest answer, but the book really talks about that journey and that like, you know, the messiness of, success and failure and you know everything in between oh my gosh I mean I I can't wait for everybody to read it I think it should be required reading (laughs) because there's like what it looks like and then there's what it's actually like it's kind of like when you go to these baby showers and we've all been to a few and everybody's like making it beautiful and it's like there's a lot of pink or there's a lot of blue and people like put things in beautiful wrapping and then you come home with this baby and your hormones are all over the place. You don't want to have sex for the next 45 years of your life. You're crying. You're exhausted. You have shame and guilt. You're also more in love than you've ever been. You want nothing around except for the baby, but then you don't want the baby, but then you miss your girlfriends. And no one talks about that at the shower. Nobody's like, hey, yeah. you're about to go upside down in every single way of your life. Good luck. Right. <laughs> so there's what the business looks like and then what it actually means in real terms, like, in the numbers, what it can actually mean, even though it looks like one thing. And there's also like your mental well-being. And I feel like we live in an interesting time where everyone's really convinced that we came to the world for a pile of things. We need as many followers, as much money, as big of an IPO, all this venture capital, like that's the success box and you better go get it. And then when you actually get it, you realize, no, I came to the world for a much bigger dream, which is called my well-being. Mm -hmm. And right now I have no clue where that is. And so if that's the ugly truth, then it doesn't matter. It's almost worse than to feel like you have all the accoutrements of a successful life. And yet inside there's still this giant emptiness that nothing outside of you can touch. And I know that that's really what you've been speaking to. And I want to hear more about that. Like what got revealed to you about yourself as you went through this journey? And what were some of the insights that you had that actually brought you back to like this much more peace that came from you knowing more about what really happiness looks like and not all the places that people want you to focus your attention because it seems like where the success and the happiness achievement is. Well, you know, I think to your point, you know, we're all chasing something and a dream of some sort, which is, which is great. And, and important but it's it's kind of more about purpose right like that yeah. and, and I can I can honestly say when we started dry bar when I you know when I had this idea which you know came out of my mobile business it was never like the impetus of it was never like to make a bunch of money and to take a you know world domination and blowouts it's like <laughs> I was not you know and just like I said in the beginning like I didn't I didn't even like I I wasn't like my, my parents had their own business but I didn't have like aspirations to be an entrepreneur. I worked for other people. When I was 16, I started working and I worked ever since. And I always worked for other people and kind of always thought I would. I, I didn't have this like entrepreneurial journey. I also didn't have a lot of women to look up to at that time. You know, I mean, it's like, it's only been sure. in the last like, yeah. you know, 10, 15 years that there's so many, you know, women starting businesses. Um, so, you know, I didn't, um, I, n- I never came to this from a place of, I want like, you know, to ma- to grow this massive business and to make all this money and to do, you know, and all this stuff, you know, that was like a byproduct truly of just doing something I loved. Yeah. However, you know, that turned into this massive business and it, it was very intoxicating and we were on this rocket ship and we had all this success and all this attention. And, you know, I think one of the biggest lessons that I learned is that, you know, a lot about like outside validation, you know, like even like the kind things that you said in the beginning, you know, it's like, I, I, one of the biggest lessons I learned, which I think was kind of your question was that, 
you, you know, you, you have to find that within yourself and getting it from other people and outside validation is, is, you know, it's, everybody kind of knows this, but you, you kind of forget it. And when we were in the throes of building this massive company and I was, you know, doing all these cool things and being on magazine covers and on TV and Shark Tank and all the things that I got to do, you know, it was like, there, there was so much coming at me that was amazing that I, I'm so grateful for it. But it, it, you know, once we sold Dry Bar and that all kind of started to stop, and I have really gone through like a major identity crisis in the last yeah. couple of years since we sold Dry Bar, you know, and it, it is like a, you know, be careful what you're chasing. And in the, you know, in the beginning, I wasn't, I wasn't chasing the money and then the money started to come. And then I did start like thinking more about the money and I, you know, and I did start thinking more about the, you know, the, like <clears throat> this, like, you know, this this like this thing that I was on that was like so you know intoxicating and and then like coming down from that and like who am I now what am I now what is my purpose now um so you know a lot of that is is in the book and a lot of that is just like where I'm at in my life and I have been for the last yes someone said like a drug it is a hundred percent a drug um of like getting all of that and not having being able to supply it for yourself I've also like I got kind of learned it's a lot of childhood shit. And it's like, you know, I've really dug into a lot of that only recently. That's not really in the book. Um, but yeah, you know, it's like, you just can get really lost. And if, and if you're not searching for the right thing and this like peace and what, you know, purpose it's, yeah, it gets, it gets messy. <laughs> yeah. It gets messy. We, uh, we used to live when we first got married, we used to live in a little townhouse on Roxbury, just South of Wilshire. And I remember thinking it was like, so beautiful. It's like, oh my God, I can't believe we can afford something. that's a little townhouse to rent. And I can like, still like stroll over to Neiman Marcus, even though I probably at that point couldn't afford anything. And the other day I went to Neiman Marcus to get something and I parked there and I was walking past this old townhouse where we used to rent. And I was thinking like, was I happier then? Mm. Like when I would, you know, walk my daughter to the park and like go get a cappuccino simpler times. yeah simpler time and like now we live in a 10,000 square foot house like overlooking the hills in Mulholland and I have all these things that I set out to do and I don't think I can tell you like hell yes I'm happier like I have more well-being as a human like I don't know that that's true um I've grown a lot I've uncovered a lot I've solved a lot of problems and I've made a big impact in some ways. And my own little Kathy self is still catching up and I'm still figuring her out and what she needs and how quickly she can get pulled into a wave and then find out that she like abandoned herself for eight months. Like it's a whole thing. And you said before, you've said like three different ways. You said, this is really new for women to be founders like this. And I really think no one's talking about it enough that my mom is in her seventies, right? I'm in my forties. So my mom graduated high school with, you can be a secretary or a nurse. Like that's my mom's generation. We are the generation of, you can go crush it. You can be a badass CEO. You can do, and there's mm -hmm. all these mixed messages of like, so yeah, go do that, but please be relatable and go be fierce, but be humble. Like, please don't like put it out there that you're so successful. And by the way, you should really be in a great relationship and you should be a great mom and be a conscious parent and do great self-care. And it's like, all I want to do is scream into a pillow. How can I accomplish all of that at the same time? Whereas with a guy, it's more like, just go, bro. Just go do you. And then they just go yeah. make as much money as they want. Nobody's like chastising them for being in their bravado. It's just like, yeah, that's what you do. Good for you. Like Mark Cuban, like ring all the bells nobody's saying to him how's your balance how are you as a dad people are just like you're awesome we love knowing that you exist right that's not the same for women and then there's also what you actually need in your life and so I'm curious as you went through this what was it like for you in the role of like mom and wife and what was it like for you with your own what does Allie actually need to feel at peace and how much of you was having to find that balance and how much of you felt like what was being asked of you 
made it difficult for you to have what you wanted in the roles of being your own person, as well as a mom, as well as a wife. Like it's, it's not the, it's not a well-worn path. And so I'm curious, like how all of that was to navigate. Well, <laughs> it was hard and it, you know, and it was, I was also working with my brother and my husband at the time, my, my first husband. And, you know, it was, um, it, you, you just, you, you, you end up on this track of, you know, where you just like dry bar became like another child to us, you know, where we were just in this work mode constantly. And it, it, there was a lot of guilt on both sides, you know, and I think that I, what I didn't feel empowered enough back then to recognize that I needed time and space for myself, you know, that there was like, I needed to be the mom. Like I needed to be the boss. I needed to be, to know what I was talking about. A, lo a lot of like what I talk about in the book too, is like, um, you know, my feeling of like, I needed to have all the answers and know all the things when instead of like saying, Hey, I don't know all the answers. I don't know all the things. What do you guys think? You know, and this like kind of, and, and I think it's kind of largely from what you're saying is like that, you know, you, we come into a role as a founder or CEO as in this, like, I have to know everything. And there's this like expectation on me to have all the answers <clears throat> when I didn't have all the answers. I mean, I don't have all the answers. I still don't have all the answers. Nobody does. Right. But there is like, to your point, but the bravado of like a man of like, you just know. And I think I felt like I had to just know, you know, and, and it's, it's shifted for me a lot. And I think it's a lot of humility to be like, I, you know, I don't actually know. And I, and I'd like to talk to other people about it. And I think that there's, you know, there, there is this, I mean, when you were talking, I was thinking about the, the Barbie movie and like the speech that she makes about, yeah. you know, how, you know, there's just all this expectation and, and all this stuff on us. But I do also, I know I'm on a call full of women, you know, i I believe all of that, but I don't let myself get like, I don't, I don't get too like sucked into that either. You know, I mean, I think that for me, it's like somebody asked me, I was speaking at, at this thing yesterday and it was like a financial conference and a woman who's a financial advisor asked me if, you know, if, if I had to choose, I actually have a financial advisor who's a man. And she said, if, if you were in a room, would you have chosen a woman, a woman or a man as your financial advisor? I was like, I don't know. It depends on who I connect with. Right. Like the question was like posed to me as like, oh, just because it's a woman, would you do that? Right. And I was like, no, if it was a woman that I like really liked and connected with and thought thought was like strange that they thought was like I ideal, then yes. If it was a man that like, you know what I mean? And so there's this, like, for me, I feel like, <clears throat> um, you know, I, 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 I recognize, of course, there's a double standard and men aren't asked the question of like, you know, how are you balancing it all? And women are always asked that question. And that is, that is annoying. And I, I think that's starting to change because women are becoming the breadwinners of the family more. Women are, um, you know, playing that role, <laughs> but it's complicated to be the breadwinner of your family. And it is emasculating to most men, you know? So it is like a, tr we're in like a tricky time of trying to figure that out and, and redefine the balance of, men and women and where and how this looks you know and how we you know how how we like define all of that I mean we are at such a tipping point I think and it's so fascinating you know for women to like really be having more of a of you know a place at the table and I know we're not there yet by any means but I do think it's for me the way I look at it is like getting to equality you know it's like I don't need I don't want or need women to be like superior to men nor do I want men to of be of course superior. that's ridiculous you no know, but I think there is this like you know I mean I mean we all kind of know women are better at multitasking things that men aren't but there's you know there's pros and cons on both sides so anyways I don't even know where I'm going with this no I, I totally get it I mean yesterday I was on the phone uh a zoom call with a new therapist that a friend of mine just introduced me to and it was because a friend of mine had said that she like threw a grenade into her marriage because she was like whatever this dynamic is I'm not in, I'm not interested anymore, you know? And I thought it was the best idea ever seven years ago. I was like, I'm going to make all this money and then you're going to not have to work. And I thought that was such a good idea at the time until he stopped being a lawyer 
and then was like potching around the house. And then a year went by and two years and I was like, oh, I'm not into this. We're like, I'm in like this provider energy and then I can now do everything that I need. And I don't know what I need from you. And like, he starts to feel emasculated, even though he's like, I'm so proud of you. It's like on some level, there's something that he doesn't love about not being able to take care of me. Right. And it's so bizarro. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I was like, you need to go back to work. I don't care what money you make. It's not about the money. Please go to work. And so literally as of a month ago, I like kind of, you know, made that like, I need you to do that. And he's, he's happier. Um, well, I think that there's like, you know, what I've learned a lot about myself is that I have been for a long time living in the mask, the masculine side of myself where, you know, same. because of right. The same thing, because I'm like running a business in charge, you know, all those things. And then feeling like, oh, I need to get back into like the feminine of my receivership. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and finding that balance is, is really tricky for sure. What do you mean? This is a big thing to say. You say this in your title and you talk about this in the book. So what do you mean when you say I almost lost myself? Well, I think when I was, you know, there was a really kind of pinnacle point in my story when we were about seven, seven, eight years into the company. And, uh, I, Cam, Cam and I got divorced and it was around the time my kids were like 11 and 13 and my son, Grant, who's now, you know, doing amazing. He's 18. He just, I just took him to college. He's playing football. That's, like that's it's amazing. It's amazing. But there, when it just, I think it was partly because of the door divorce and just partly because of like where he was at in his life, you know, that he started doing drugs and started getting like, and, and became addicted and we had to put him in treatment and he was in treatment for about two years. That's and really, that, really hard. Yeah. I mean, in that two years, you know, we were like fighting for his life. Like it was, it was dark and it was sad and it was hard and it's, it's in the book. There's a whole chapter about it, which by the way, he's totally giving me his sign off and like the amazing soul that he is, is like, I want, other people to, you know, have to understand this. And by the way, it's, it's pretty amazing that, you know, and I don't know if it, if there's anybody on this call who's lived this, but it's pretty amazing when you do talk about this stuff, how many, you know, families are dealing with this too. It's just, it's like, nobody wants to talk about it. And I didn't want to talk about it either because I felt like I must be a really shitty mom to have a kid that, ha that is in rehab, you know? And I was very ashamed of it. At, at the time, because it was like, oh, I'm going to be so judged for this because I built this big business and I had this big thing. And so I wasn't paying enough attention to my kid, which might be partially true to see like what was happening with him. I, I moved my kids around a lot, like, you know, and they were a little, there was a little bit of fallout that happened with my son. And I'll tell you though, it was like the greatest gift. And my, my kid is so evolved. And I think that like, I think every human should have to go through the programs that he went through. I mean, he went to like, you know, three different places. And one was this program in Utah where like you live off the land for like as long as it takes. And you're, you're with therapists and other kids who are going through this. And he became this evolved soul and he learned what was happening inside of him. Like he couldn't articulate what was going on for him when stuff was going on for him. And so that's happening. And that whole process was almost two years. And that obviously, I mean, I, you know, it made you emotional. It like took me down as a mom and I was going through a divorce at the time and the divorce was like the right thing, but I was, you know, I spiraled into like a very deep depression because I was, you know, I, I was like, I didn't know what was going to happen with my kid. He was, he was suicidal too. It was like, it was really rough and dark and, you know, and I, my, my world like really collapsed. And, you know, I, I was at the time Cam and I were not really speaking. It was in the beginning and, and we obviously had to come back together to help our son. So that was a blessing, you know, and, but, you know, it was like, I went from like getting a divorce, now being a single mom and navigating that world and now my son in going into rehab, I was like, you got I'm like everything imploded. And then because like we, you know, logistically we shared an office, a creative office. So I couldn't go to that office anymore. So now I don't even like go to my 
job. And I was like, oh my God, my, you know, my, I was just like on the floor. I mean, it was, it was really rough. And, and so that was the, like losing myself part, you know, where everything was starting to change in dry bar because we were like, you know, at this point where we had hired a lot of other people to do a lot of the things that I had previously done, which was the totally the right thing to do. But you know, it was like my role in the company was, was evolving and changing into something else. And my, what I had done for so many years was changing. And then, you know, I was like, trying to just, you know, deal with what was happening with my son. And, you know, it was a lot of like, even though he was away at rehab, it was like calls all the time and letters and a lot of things. And like, just emotionally, you know, my bandwidth was, was pretty tapped and I was going through a divorce. And, you know, even though, the divorce was, you know, something I wanted it, you know, it was like, I remember like an energy healer telling me once that like, you may be okay with the divorce, but this person held energy and space in your life for a long time. And now they're gone. And now you have this big hole and you have the, your kid, you know, who was going so about to start ninth grade away. So, you know, Grant didn't come back until he was like, oh, you know, until like, the middle of 10th grade when that point we were in COVID, it was just like, it was such a mess, you know, that whole point. And luckily because the company was at a place where it was like, we had a lot of people, like I was able and, you know, and everybody was very understanding of, of all I was going through and, and all Cam and I were going through and just like, it was just, it was, it was just a, a really difficult time to navigate. And, and I did, you know, feel like, you know, I had to really like do a lot of soul searching. I had to do a lot of work on myself. I, you know, I, I had to like get myself out of this really tough stage. And that, that was the like losing myself, you know, and that was like dry bar was on fire then like dry bar was at, you know, we were like at the top of our game, but I had to like duck out for a while because I needed to like get my, my life under control personally, you know? And so that, that was really the like unraveling of my world, you know, which I, you know, would, would eventually put back together. You know, it's, uh, I was totally emotional as you were talking. And I feel like, uh, as I said, at the very beginning of this, like you've always been so brazenly authentic. And yet this story is new for me, this part of the story. Um, and it's so courageous. And I also feel like, I remember when, uh, the Broadway show, Dear Evan Hansen came out and I, flew to New York. I could cry just thinking about it um, to see Ben Platt in it on Broadway. And then I saw it four other times. And the reason I couldn't get up from my seat at the end of the show and the reason why everyone went to see it from Beyonce to every person went to see it I is because it. everyone has, you saw, everyone has the same secret, which is if you really knew me, you would know how I'm barely hanging on. Everyone actually has days like that all the time that we just don't show because we play this character. And so it's interesting that you talk about like almost losing yourself because the self that you lost was the self that was all of these things. And yet who you really were is what you actually gained. Like what actually happened was you pulled over to the side of your life <laughs> and said, I'm not going to play this part right now. Right. And I'm going to deal with the house that's on fire that everyone who lives on your block has a house that's on fire, but they self-medicate with like scrolling Instagram or whatever the hell they're doing. And really, in a way, the most beautiful thing came out of something so horrific, which is that your kid and your family got so hyper present yes. to what's actual, to what's real. And to me, what I hear because this is what I felt when my parents got divorced and I was like 14, ready to be like, I'm done. Like I'm done with life. Like this is insane hell and I'm out. And then over the course of my life, what I've learned is when I see kids like that, those are the kids who are super aware. Those are the kids who are so spiritual and so have such a capacity to perceive that the mundane garbage, three-dimensional la 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 stuff. They're like, this isn't cutting it for me. Like, I know there's something I'm trying to reach for. And because this is the matrix you're putting me in, I can't do it. Like I need to like opt out of this stupid, like whatever people look at as like, this is life as you know it. And so there's a tremendous amount of power and goodness. And I love the last thing I'll just say, I love when you even named it, 
the feeling of shame. Because to me, grief is one thing, pain is one thing, anger is one thing, but the most toxic thing in the world is shame. Because there's no way to be with shame. There's a way to be with hurt, pain, sadness, grief, anger. Shame is gross. It's like it's like a cancer. You can't digest it. And of course you would have thought that. Meanwhile, everyone who's listening to you right now is like, thank God she's saying it because I have a version of that of my own in my own life. And I don't know how to remove the shame long enough to like be awake and get the help I need. And to me, it just makes you that much more lovable. And I know you kind of know that viscerally, but to me, I hope you hear that you're basically the ambassador on behalf of every single human who's holding on to shame for all kinds of reasons. And by you having the courage to name this, which takes so much guts, it, it, it releases people from the shackles of their shame. It, 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 it gives people the kind of medicine that only somebody in exactly your position can give them. And I really hope that you, it's big. It's really big. Thank you. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's, you know, part of the, you know, to your question in the beginning of like, you know, you know, deciding to write this book and to put it all out there, um, you know, is like, is, you know, to show that like, to your point, it's like everyone's going through, I love, I love everyone's going through something, but I love your analogy about, I had to pull over, you know, the side of the road of my life. Um, you know, and I think that like, it's so easy to go unconscious, unconscious to your life and what's like really going on and, yeah. and that you're not paying attention to all the things that are crumbling around you. You know, I, I remember like, I knew it in my bones that something was off with my son and I resisted leaning into it for a long time. And, you know, and it, and it was detrimental, you know, and I think that we, because we're like trying to keep up with these appearances and we're trying to be a certain way, you know, that we stop paying attention to the things that we need to pay attention to. And it's so dangerous, you know, and it's like, the more we're talking about these real things, I think it's like, you know, the less like weird and, you know, the stigma around it, you, you know, and I think like, I think from that time in my life, I, I really like came to feel like I, I fucking hate small talk. And like, I don't yep. want to talk about the weather. Like I want to talk about, like, I always want to like get into it with people. Like what's really Thanks. going on? Yeah. You? you know, and if you were to meet me and like, we ran into each other on the street, I would tell you like some pretty like heavy shit that's happening in my life right now. You know, that, you know, because I just feel like it, the, the, the more we talk about these things and again, like, you know, I, I'm so proud of my son for being okay with me putting this out there. I mean, we actually, I just went to visit him this weekend and we were talking about it and he was like, I was like, you know, because he was telling me, which is really so sweet and fun to hear. He's like, a lot of the girls at this at college know who you are. They know dry bar and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, that's nice. And then like, he kind you know, I was like, do you like that? Or you're not like that, you know? And he's like, no, it's cool. But then he was like, I was like, you know, you know, my book's coming out soon. And like, there's a whole chapter about you. Like everyone's gonna, I was like, have you told people like your story? And he was like, yeah, some people I'm like, well, they're all gonna know really soon, you know? And, but it's like, you know, just the fact that like, he's, he's, we're all kind of owning it. And we, we let the, like, to your point about the shame, we let this like, feeling of shame go and just be like, yeah, we, we went down this kind of dark road and we're owning it and we're okay with it. And everybody, to your point, it's like, everybody's going through something at some time, you know, <laughs> not, not all the time. Like there's definitely times in our lives where like things are like seemingly pretty good, but that's when shit happens, by the way. It's like, I saw this quote, I think it was like Robert De Niro, where he was like, don't get complacent in your life. I got very complacent in my life and my success, you know? So it was like, I was like not paying attention. I was like, everything was, was great. Like I was good, you know? And then I was like, and then I got like punched in the face with my life because I wasn't like there, my awareness wasn't there. I wasn't paying attention. And I think that we can go on autopilot in so many ways in all the like relationships and all of that, you know? And now I'm like so much more vigilant and so much more aware of like kind of where I'm at and, and like making sure I'm doing the work on myself, like I'm meditating and I'm writing in my journal and I'm doing therapy and I'm doing, I have like, I have a spiritual, I mean, I have so many people, you know, because I mean, not that you have to have all of that stuff, but just making sure you're doing whatever you need to do to check in to like, make sure like things are 
on track and you're not missing things in your life because it's just so easy to, to miss them, you know? And yeah. Yeah. And just not talk about it. And, and, and again, going back to like the, 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 the impetus for the book is like just talking about all this stuff. And, and the book is largely, and we're talking about so much personal stuff, but the book is, you know, a lot of business lessons on like what worked for, for me, what didn't work, work, what I learned, what I would do a little differently. And like all these lessons that I learned, um, with, with growing this company and, and just how my personal life, like inter intertwined with it, because it does, you know, it's like, I used to say, and I, and I hate that I said this, but I used to always say like, it's not business. It's not personal. It's business where I don't feel like that at all anymore. I've learned that they are so connected and we take our shit with us wherever we go. And, and to own that and to, to, you know, to like tell people that, and to be really transparent about that, it's just, it's just such a better way to live. You know, I wish, I wish everybody was like that. hundred <laughs> percent. I think what we all forget because we all have this like primal need for belonging is that the only sexy thing that will make anything viral or anything work yeah. is authenticity. That's the glue. Like when somebody's real in a room and says, I've been sober for six years or whatever it is, you're just like, oh, I like you because you're honest, you know, all of a sudden you lean in. And so that's actually a superhero gift to be that vulnerable and authentic. I also just want to say that I think that our brains love to put things in black and white boxes and make things really simplified because it's just the way that brains can work. And so what I want to say out loud is, yes, it's one thing to look at like the complex life that happens when somebody becomes successful. Let's not forget though, that if you were not successful for people who are quote unquote, not successful, right? They don't have a hundred stores or whatever. They still have a complex life. So you shouldn't walk away with this lesson of like, therefore don't be an entrepreneur and don't be successful and don't, because therefore you will have all these problems. It's like life is lifey, right? You are here to grow and there's a whole different set of issues if you look at someone who's not showing up, um, meeting their edge and 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 talking themselves out of starting things because of imposter syndrome and tolerating less than they deserve because they don't want to raise their prices or they don't want to stand up to someone. That's a whole other set of stuff. And yeah. so it's it's a beautiful gift that you are kind of taking us through the whole looking glass so we can really, really see it. And I don't think that we should shortchange the fact that while all of that is real, what we just talked about and so sacred and so important, you are a badass and being able to build a business means you have a tremendous amount of radical empathy. You understand human beings. That's what having a business means. It's like, you've been able to figure out who this woman is you serve. And if you, if something works once you could say, Oh, it's luck. But if you're able to work something out over and over and over and over again, it's like, no, 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 no. This person has a capacity to understand human behavior, to understand how to show up with grace and ease to a certain extent, which is giant. And I just want to name that because women do need a model of that. And you are the best model of that. And that is so impressive and so freaking cool. And so from that standpoint, as we're sort of like wrapping up the next five minutes, what's one business lesson from that standpoint that you really are proud of? Like something about yourself that if you could whittle it all down, if I could give you just one thing and you could say, this might be my greatest secret sauce to how I built that. If I had to pick one thing that was a little bit singular about me, this is what I think my zone of genius was in building that business. I think it's like a combination of my intuition and my decisiveness. I, I very strongly, I think I've always had a very good, strong, like gut feeling that, I mean, I think we all do. I think I just, I'm, I'm really tuned into it and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really quick on my feet about like problem solving and figuring things out. I think that's kind of my superpower. Um, and I'm like, I'm I'm not wishy-washy. Like I and and it's good and bad. I I will I know exactly what I want to do right away. And like you can't like talk me off that ledge. Sometimes that does get me into trouble, but you know, it's also, you know, it's like I, I, I'm a big believer that our strengths are our weaknesses, you know. So True. you know, for me, it's like I'm not gonna like hem and haw and not make a decision and like mull shit over for a long time. 
again, that's gotten me in trouble sometimes, but it's also really been a big part of my success too. Um, and, and really following my, my gut instinct. And, and when I haven't, I, you know, it's like, I'm like, shit, I should have listened to what I really thought, you know? And, and it's, and it's like, you don't really find that out until afterwards when you were like, I know I had, I know I had, you know, this like feeling that it wasn't going to work out, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, it's also how you learn and, and how you become better and, and all of that. So, you know, I get asked a lot of, I get asked in interviews all the time, like, do you have regrets? Like, are there things that you would do differently? And it's like, no, not one. You know, even my kid, even my son who went through what he went through, like he is such a better kid for it. And we're all better for it. It was rough and it sucked. And at the time I didn't want it to be happening, but it, it really made us all better. And it's the same thing with, you know, you know, things that I got wrong at dry bar that I just like learned from, you know? And so anyways, you know, I think trusting my intuition and, you know, get putting myself out there and not being you know, I mean, you, you've, you've been so generous with your compliments to me that, and I'm really appreciative of, but I think that like, for me, it's like, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about it, what people think, you know, it's like, some people are going to like what I say. And some people aren't going to like what I say. And that's cool. Like whatever, like you it, take it or leave it. You don't have to like, like everything or agree with everything that I say. And, and I think that that is also of like a bit of a superpower of like, you know, like, this is just, this is me and who, this is who I am. And, you know, and I, and I, I want to like always speak my truth of like what, what's happening for me. And, you know, and, and I think that it's, it, it does like tend to resonate with people, which is like, again, large part of like writing this book was like, let me, let me like let you guys behind the curtain of like how, what really goes on, you know? And a lot of the book has a lot of like, um, you know, information about, you know, growing or like raising money, selling, you know, taking money off the table as an entrepreneur and selling your company and all that stuff too. So, you know, I just want to give people like the, the, the real, the truth. But anyways, oh, it's like, it's like I the digress. business book everybody needed that they didn't know they needed and has to have like I as a so. must read. It really should be required reading for every woman who's curious about entrepreneurship or in the middle of a business. It yeah. should be required. And there's definitely a lesson for everybody in this book, no matter what stage of your business you're at, or you're, even if you're just in a job, like I, I talk to a lot of people that are, um, in like, you know, just, they're just working their way up in a company and there's all, there's the lessons that, you know, we'll, we'll speak to them too. Yeah. It's huge. And I just want to, I'm going to ask you one more question, but I just want to comment on what you just said. I think it's so huge. I, I heard my friend Susie say the word underthink. She's like, everybody's overthinking everything. Start underthinking things. And I realized that that's also something that I'm accused of on my team and also what a superpower is. And they, it is a strength and a weakness, but I literally just don't ruminate. I'm just like, let's go, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. And I just see so many people wait to make a decision. It's just like, oh my God, you could have already made the wrong decision, but have learned from that. Like, let's go just freaking yeah. move your it's butt. Like just- and figure it out on the way down. Totally, you know? totally. Yeah. So yeah. the last question I was going to ask you, and you said it, you, you said something about this earlier is like redefining your like sense of purpose, right? Since you sold Drybar, you've been involved with like a bunch of other really cool businesses. And I'm curious in this moment, as you're looking towards the horizon, like what feels like this is you in your, in your identity, like this is you waking up in purpose. Like, what does that look like for you now? I mean, the thing that comes to mind mostly is like being of service to others. And I, and I mean that in a lot of ways, I mean, first and foremost, like, um, you know, I, I get a lot of satisfaction from advising and helping other entrepreneurs who are in there in the throes of, of building a business. Um, and, and, you know, I, I learned so much on the job as I was, as we were growing dry bar, like so much, you know, as someone who didn't go to college and doesn't have like a fancy business degree, I learned how to run. I learned so much stuff that stuff that I don't even like remember until right. somebody talks about it, you know, but so I, you know, so I use, I, I use, do a lot of, um, mentoring. Like I'm on this, this site called intro. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it where people can like, you know, book time with me yep. and that whole thing. I, I'm just launching a mastermind with a couple of, um, with Jacqueline Johnson, who's the founder of Create and Cultivate and uh, oh, Marina wow. Mills, who's a branding expert. It's like, you know, it's, it's a container for like women to have access to all of us. And then there's a big event and a whole thing, you know? Um, 
and and so and I'm also like I'm just starting this pretty big like volunteer program at CHLA like I am you know really trying to I'm in a I'm in a phase of like giving back and and being like of service of what I've you know, what I've been able to accomplish and, and, you know, how I can impart that on others versus like, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't have a desire to build a company again, the way I did with Drybar. I, you know, we started Squeeze and Okay Humans and Brightside, and these are all other companies that I advise on and I've, you know, funded and I'm on the board and all me and my brother, but I just don't, I don't have the desire to do that. I am working on a new project that I can't reveal just yet. That is actually like my brother, you know, called me last week and he's like, let's do this. And I was like, huh, maybe, you know, so I'm still entertaining a lot of things. Um, but I, but I feel most like purpose driven to give back and to, and, and just like the way people light up when you can like frame something that's going on for them or help them in some way. I just, I really enjoy it. And, and so I, I feel like that's kind of where my, purpose and path is right now. I love that. And I feel, I feel it so strongly. And I just want to say out loud that I don't think there's any greater service you can ever do for a human being than to help them see clearer and further than they could see a second before. And I feel like take like a rocket science. It's like, I've, I'm, I'm smart and and successful and whatever, but I'm not like, I'm, I'm usually not the smartest person in the room. I don't, I don't claim to know more than other people, but even just zooming out. Yep when you can't, you're so in it is like having somebody who can be like, Oh no, it's, it's so clear to me. Yeah. Like really? And then they are like, Oh, I didn't even see that. It's, it's mind blowing. I love it. Yeah. And in that way, I feel like this, this conversation to me for whatever it's worth is like a rocket ship that as this book comes into the world, I see this being very uniquely yours, like being willing not just willing, but also present. Like there are some people who are unwilling, but then there are people who might be willing, but they just don't have it to share. They didn't go do the excavation. You like went through the dark night of the soul and you're willing to take us there and you have a PhD in building a business. So (laughs) I feel like my spidey sense is that over the next year, three years, you will emerge as such a pivotal, definitive person. It's beyond being a thought leader. It's like, this is a movement, which is only yours. Like, I don't see anyone sitting at the bus stop called this level of authenticity, plus like knowing the three things that you need to know. And so I'm very excited for for that because talk about serving, this blesses human beings' hearts on such a radical level. So tell everybody where they can buy the book. I'm sure it's already on pre-sale. It comes out in like a month. So tell every two months, tell everybody where they can buy it. Yes. It's on pre-order now. You can go to aliweb.com or Amazon or wherever you buy books. It's pretty much available everywhere on pre-order. I'm actually doing an audio version of it too. That's cool. Recording it this week, as a matter of fact. Um, So it launches November 14th, but yeah, it's available now. And you know, all my projects and all my things are just on my Instagram, which is just Ali Webb. So yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on. What a nutritional, helpful, beautiful conversation. Thank you. Likewise. It was, it was good to be with you. Good to chat. Always good to chat with you. And Amazing guys go buy the book. We'll put you. the link in the show notes. We'll send it to everyone. <laughs> and I'm sure like every person who hears this is going to go buy the book. Thank well, you, Ali. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Have an amazing rest of your day. You too.